So we see numerous and denominator. Uh, we could go through quotient rule, but what's the preference? Is that we can clean this up and just rely on what? Uh, there being uh, one term on the denominator. Um, power rule. Power rule. Yeah. So let's go ahead and do some cleanup. Right. We can split up into individual fractions. Bring the denominator up to the top. Resolve each of the X's so that they can be merged together. And then all three of the conditions at the top should be resolved and we should be able to rely on power rule. Okay, so let's try number 11. Again on page 14 here. So three individual fractions, radicals converted to rationals. Now that we've separated them, they can each be treated like an individual problem and, and they're not going to impact each other anymore. But now every variable is still out of place. We've got to bring them up to the top one by one. So now once the variables are up to the top, we still are not quite ready for power rule. The X's have to be merged together. How do we merge those X's together? Add, good. Add or subtract, right? We don't multiply. We only multiply exponents if they're directly next to each other, right? And then after this step, now then you'll be ready for power rule, right? But Now I can um, go through power rule, right? Bring the exponents down. And then subtract one from the exponents. Match common denominators, right? Minus two over two for each of the fractions. So seven halves comes down, seven halves becomes five halves, one half comes down, one half becomes negative one half. Third fraction, uh, third term, negative one half comes down, and negative three halves becomes our new exponent. We'll merge the coefficients together and then bring down any negative exponents. But technically, this is the derivative, okay? It's just that I prefer or I want. Um, negative exponents to be resolved, but technically this is the same as this. It's just that um, they're both derivatives. It's just I just want the exponents in a in a cleaner place. But if you leave your answer in this form, you will still get a majority of the credit points. Just that you know I'm gonna take out a little bit just because um, in the directions I'll say no negative exponents, but you've done most of the work to get to that F prime and you'll earn majority of the credit there. Any questions there? Let me just do a quick. Um, a 
Uh, let me save it for uh, for later. Uh, okay, any questions with 11 here? Okay, uh, I do want us to uh, skip down to number uh, to number 13. And I do want to go through those steps before we go into the quiz review, so. here. Finding an equation of a tangent line. So the way you find the equation of a tangent line, we want to gather three pieces of information. We need to find order pair. Order pair comes from the original function. We need to find a slope. Slope comes from the derivative function. And then we put in the point slope form. Okay? Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. So number 14, um, if negative four wasn't given to us, how would you find that y value? Yeah, into the original, right? So one minus two, that's, neg that's negative one. One squared plus three, that's four. Negative one times four is negative four. Okay, so just make sure that we know that they don't have to give you the y value. They could give you the x value and you have to take that additional step to get that y value. Okay, so now I want to find the derivative so that we can get to the slope. What are our two options to find the derivative? We could do what? Yeah, foil and then rely on power rule. And that's probably the, the preferred way because it's not too difficult to, to pull this out. All right, what's the second option? Okay. Product rule. Okay. So I know that we prefer power rule because it's easy enough, um, probably not worth the trouble to go through product rule, but for practice purposes, let's do product rule. Okay. Now, um, next section, we're going to see, okay, the need for product rule more and more when when expressions get too difficult for uh, for, uh, for expansion to occur. But uh, for now, let's go through a product rule just to get that practice. F prime G plus F G prime. What's F prime here? One, right? Back to F. What's G prime? Two X. What? Plus three, okay. Okay, we're really after the equation of tangent line, so let's not worry about trying to clean this up. We have the derivative, so now what can I do to find the slope? Okay, we'll pair. Um, okay, we have the order pair. What can you? Okay, but what 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 value are we going to plug in? The one. Okay, so right now, if it's a function, the only value that the derivative needs is the x value. Okay? It doesn't need the y value. However, down the road, if we're dealing with equations that are not functions, we may need the y value. But for now, the only thing we need is dx. Okay, so again, we don't really care about cleaning up. We just want to get that number. So I get four plus so what's my slope? Negative one. So whatever this graph looks like, the derivative is just going to do the job of telling us the steepness of any point on the graph. We have our order pair, we have our slope. Finally, we just do point slope form. Order pair. Slope, what's slope form? G squared. Right. Um, why do we not do G squared? The derivative form. G squared is not for product rule, but for what? For quotient rule, yeah. So look very similar, right? F prime G, but 
uh, with quotient rules f prime g minus fg prime all over g squared. Yeah, if it was x minus two divided by x plus three x, then yeah, we do four have to go through a quotient. Okay. Any questions? Okay, let's um, skip a few pages. Let's go to page 25, and um, we're just going to see how much of this review we can get through. So, page 25, number one. Okay, everybody okay with this um, problem here? Okay, so it says find dy dx. That just means find the derivative, the same thing as saying y prime. Um, so uh, we're just going to go through a cleanup. Okay? And let's just rely on power rule for every term. Technically, we could go through product rule for that uh, 7x cubed for the x minus 1, it's just, but it's not worth the trouble. It's, this is simple enough where we, we don't want to have to go through a product rule unless, unless we have to, right? So the time to distribute and clean up every term. Make sure every term is set up and ready before you do power rule. And when you do power rule, you can just do it all and uh, all at the same time for each of the terms. So, um, right, resolve your parentheses, um, radicals, resolve your radicals, and then make sure that your variables are all sitting in the numerator. Okay, so try that. Would be the seven x cubed through, and what I like to do is I like to just make every term look the same. So if we're, if I ever see a denominator co um, numeric value, I like to push it out in front. That way, I mean you don't have to, but I just find that you know if I can make every problem look exactly the same, then I'm never going to be thrown off because it's just I'm going to go through the same process, right? Power rule every time. So. I know that seems like a small deal, but you know, I think if it helps you visually, pulling that number in front is nice because then you don't have to ever have to stare at the number below my variable. My power rule is very straightforward. Okay. Yes. Why is it um for five x? Why is it one through a negative seven x? Good question, right? So this, yeah, this is the one that that I, I find um, gives students the most trouble here. So this is square root of x to the seventh, right? So how do we write this as a rational exponent? Seven over what? Start over two. But it's in the denominator, so it's in the wrong place. So we got to push it up to the top. Negative seven over two. But you know, this is the one that allows students to say one over seven. Right? We see that empty space, and we want to assume that it's a one, but it's not a one. It's on the left side. That's a two. Seven over two. So any question with the cleanup? We haven't done anything with derivatives. We've just gotten the every term set up and ready, met these conditions, but now we're ready to do power. Okay, so go ahead and find dy dx, go ahead and find y prime. Power rule for each term. All right, bring down the exponent, subtract one from the exponent. 
Let me just point out two things here before um, um, have you guys finish out this problem. What's the derivative of four pi x? It's just four pi, right? If this is linear, then I'm just basically removing the x and whatever's out in front, that's my derivative. What's the derivative of five pi to the fourth? 25. Zero, right? Make sure that we don't treat pi as a variable because if we do, then maybe we're thinking it's 20 pi to the third power, right? But pi is not a variable. We don't do a power rule for constants. That's just a number, right? It looks like a variable. It's a symbol. It looks like a variable, but the constant goes to zero, right? Exponent comes down, subtract one from the exponent. Four fifths come down, four fifths minus one fifth is negative. Sorry, minus five fifths is negative one fifth. Bring down the negative seven halves, multiply with any existing coefficient, subtract one from the exponent, negative seven halves minus two over two is negative nine halves. And then that's the derivative, but I'm going to say no negative exponents in the answer, so I just have to resolve these two exponents and bring those x's back down to the bottom. Eypx is just another notation for y prime. No, um, you can just say Y prime. Thing. Any questions here? OK, off to the side here, um, if you have any room, I just want to talk about something related here. Um, what if um, there was a problem that looked like the last term, but there was a number up front? Let's say it's 3 over 4 square root of x to the fifth. How would you get this cleaned up to get it ready for power rule? X to the Five over two. Okay, good. Five over two. Now it's still not ready for power rule, right? We got that uh, rational exponents show up. Um, what would that look like to get it ready for power rule? Mm -hmm. The negative. Okay. Uh, so where uh, where's the four go? At the bottom. Okay, still stays. Okay, so we got to separate that x away from. The bottom, I see some students do this. They bring that four up and they make it 12. Okay, but that four is going to have to stay there. It's going to be three fourths. And then even better, pull the X out in front so that it's completely, you know, separated from that three fourths. And that way it looks exactly like all the previous problems, right? You got that coefficient, nothing under the variable. And then power rule from here, then, then it's easy, right? But I think the hardest part is not power rule, it's getting to that point so that you can. Do, uh, do this algebraic step correctly 
so they can go through get to the probable step. Okay, so yeah, you know we can separate two terms of their multiplication. Now, if it was four plus x to the five halves, then we're stuck. But that four and the x can be separated um, simply by changing the exponent of the x. All right, uh, let's look at number two. Okay, so similar to number 14 that we did on the previous page, um, we're going to ask be asked to find to write the equation of the line tangent to the function. So we need to find order pair, we need to find slope, and we do point slope form. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and find the derivative to get that the calculus portion out of the way. Okay, so if I want to find f prime, what method do I have to use? Good quotient rule, right? There's only there's two terms in the bottom. I have no way around this. I got to go through quotient rule. So the top is my F, bottom is my G. Okay, piece by piece, we got to fill this in. Uh, what's X plus four's derivative? G function, no changes. Let's copy that down. Minus F. And what's G prime? 2X. All over. Square. 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 What will that look like? X squared minus 2. Okay. Now it's asking for us to simplify fully. So let's talk about how to simplify this without making uh, a common mistake. I know this is tempting, but we cannot do this. We cannot take these x squared minus 2 out. Okay. That minus sign is, is connecting these terms in a way that is preventing us from, do that, from doing this. Okay. So when it says simplify fully, Usually with quotient rule, that's what's what a lot of students want to do. They want to take these out. But what you want to do with simplifying is you want to leave the denominator alone. Some, uh, some of that's in factor form is nice and clean. There's no need to expand that out. We're just going to try to distribute and clean up that numerator. Okay, so basically you're going to cover the denominator. The denominator doesn't need any cleanup. Okay, so there's no need to reduce or anything like that or rewrite. You're just focused on the numerator. So that's what the cleaned up version would look like, especially if you're dealing with quotient rule. Leave the denominator out of it. The denominator is gone. It's just a numerator you have to worry about. Okay. All right, so done the calculus, and now we're just gathering information here. So write the equation of the tangent line. So we first need to find the point. So how do I find the point? Plug in. 1 into the original, right? Mm -hmm. The original function, good. All right. And um, I also need to find the slope. 
So how do I find the slope? One into the derivative. Yep. You have your order pair, you have your slope, point slope form. Any questions with two? So it's important that um, we know how to start the problem. Sometimes um, you know, if you're looking at a problem, you're not going to be told, hey, use power rule here, use product rule here, use quotient rule here. We need to be able to look at the problem and kind of go through our decision making and try to figure out what steps to take. So here, numerator and denominator with denominator with multiple terms, I got to go through quotient rule, right? You have to understand that. And just be careful that, you know, I see this a lot where students are just looking at the numerator and denominator and treating them like separate entity, you know, entities and just doing power rule for both and saying, oh, x plus four is one, x squared minus two x is two x, great, there's my derivative. And then they just mess up the whole problem because they started with the wrong derivative process. Okay, number three, um, looking at how number three is set up, um, we we have two options. Either we can what? Foil it out. Yeah, foil it out. Um, but here, I think this is one where it may be too many terms to foil out. It may not be worth the trouble. So let's practice going through what's, what's another option that we can do? Oh. Product rule. Yeah, let's just practice going through product rule, even though technically, you know, you could expand all the way out and, and do power rule. Okay, but let's practice going through product rule to get that get that process a little bit more comfortable. Now, this is only asking for us for us to evaluate the slope at one. So as soon as you find the derivative, it's going to be a mess, but there's no need to clean up. Just insert one into the derivative, get a number, and then that's your slope. And you can just stop the problem there because it's not asking for you to clean up the derivative. It's really just asking you to get to the slope value. OK, so what I did to begin with to get the terms ready for product rule, I just rewrote that four root x as four x to the one half. And that way I can jump directly to f prime g plus f g prime. So see if you can fill in what goes in those slots within product rule. Again, you said only put it over um, g of x squared if it has a fraction, right? That's right. Only for quotient rule do you have to worry about the g of g, g squared. Right? If it's product rule, just the numerator, just f prime g plus f g prime, and that's all there is. So f prime is just 15x to the fourth minus 2x to the negative one half. And G stays the same. F stays the same. Let me ask you this. What is g prime going to be? Just 2, right? 2x becomes 2. 5 pi goes to 0. 9 also goes to 0. OK, so it looks like a mess. Leave it like that. And now I just want to find the slope. It's only asking for the slope. so. Insert one into the derivative. Try to clean up as much as you can. These numbers are a little large, so you're just 
inserting and trying to clean up. Okay, any questions with number, first page, number three? Okay, so whenever you're ready, let's go to page 26 and we'll do a particle motion problem, see how far we can get. Whatever we don't finish, we can do tomorrow. Okay, page 26. We're we learning 2.4 before the quiz. Yes, but it's, it won't be on the quiz. 2.4 won't be on the quiz. Cool. Okay, everybody good? Okay, I see some people still working on this, so uh, go to page 26. And it's just, you know, you got a part of particle motion problem. You got X of T. A, B, and C you should find easy, right? Find the velocity, find the acceleration, and then evaluate the velocity and, and the acceleration. So go ahead and try A, B, and C, and we'll we'll uh, check our work out with that. Power rule uh, will be uh, sufficient to find velocity and acceleration. There's no messiness with my position function. Every term is set up nicely for power rule. Parts B and C easy as well. You're just inserting time into velocity or inserting one into, um, sorry, a four into acceleration. Now, directions they do say include units of measure with your answer. So, what can we finish this with? Keep for a second. What about acceleration? Feet per second per second or feet per second squared? Everybody good so far? Okay, so this is one of the troublesome problems here. Part D, find the average velocity of the particle from three to eight. How do we, what's the formula for average velocity? Change in position over change in time. Yeah, so velocity, think of velocity as just the slope of position, right? slope of position. No, we're not going to touch velocity function here because we just want to know what is the average. We're not asking for the specific velocity at a point. We're looking at the velocity over a course of time. So
Okay, so these numbers are a little large. Um, I will make these numbers more manageable, especially on the quiz with no calculator. But x of three, you're just going to insert into the position function. X of eight, same thing here into the original function. It's going to come out to 13, and our unit of measure is feet per second. Even though we did not touch the velocity function, we are doing a calculation that is velocity related. So feet per second. Okay, part E. When is the particle at rest? What is that? We want zero for B and T. Good. So take velocity set equal to zero and solve for T. Okay, last one here, part F, and then we'll pick up the rest tomorrow. When is the particle moving right? When is the particle change directions? We want to create a sign line so that we can read that information off the sign line, right? So we're going to create a velocity sign line. And what can we place onto that sign line? Good, so part E kind of leads us into part F, right? We have these critical points, and that's going to help uh, separate our intervals here. Now, is there a restriction with our domain? Okay, what does it say? Yeah, so that means there is a starting point for us. Okay, and I'm not going to leave that left side blank, that we are going to be dealing with the starting value. There's no negatives in the in our domain. So we're going to find test numbers, and then we're going to decide which direction each of these intervals um, this particle is moving. So what's the number that we can use between 0 and 1? Yeah, 0.5. Okay, do the 1.5. An easy number to use between 1 and 5, I'll choose 2. And the test number we can choose to the right of 5, we can test 6. Okay. Uh, which version of the velocity function do we want to test with? Okay, factor form, right? That's the easiest one. That way you're not having to do a bunch of calculations. You can just look to see if you can gather the sign that you need. So let's see if it's positive or negative, okay? So don't worry about the three. The three is positive, so it has no impact on your, on your sign. Okay, one half minus five, negative. One half minus one. Also negative, so two negatives is. Okay. Uh, two minus five. Two minus one. Positive. Negative times positive. Okay, next up is six. Six minus five. Positive. Six minus one. Positive. Okay. Now, once you once you test your numbers, you don't care about these numbers anymore. You're never going to use this again. They're not going to show up in your intervals, so you're just using it to fill your your signs. But then after that, don't get thrown off by those numbers. We don't want to include those numbers in interval, any of our intervals. So, when is the particle moving to the right? Between zero and one. Five to Okay, 
now there's a subtle thing here. The interval I have using parentheses. But is everything going to be parentheses here? No. There's a bracket hiding here. Do you know where that is? Zero. Zero, zero is not a place where the velocity is zero, right? So the particle is technically potentially already moving. So if I insert zero into the velocity, what do I get? 15, which is positive. So that means when the timer starts, this particle is already moving. So that's a little tricky here because they are including zero as an interval as part of our domain. And if we test zero, it's already moving right. And zero is not a place where this object is stopping, right? It's where the timer starts, but the time, but this particle stops at one and five. OK, uh, we'll finish F tomorrow as well as well as the rest of the page. And then um, we will do a chain rule tomorrow for um, just to get that. OK, come up and get your phone.